All right. <clears throat> so I am Dr. Dan Scheiman. I'm the Bird Conservation Director for Audubon, Arkansas, State Office of the National Audubon Society. Bird Conservation Director is a fancy title for ornithologist, which is a fancy title for Birdman. And a lot of people call me Dr. Dan the Birdman. I have been birding for about 30 years, and I've been with Audubon, Arkansas for about 15 years now. I love birds, I love birding, and I love sharing my love of birds with people. And today I'm going to be talking a bit about how, uh, about some of the tools and skills that you need to better watch and identify birds. So bird watching, birding is shorthand for bird watching, just like birder is shorthand for bird watcher. But depending on who you ask, the two do have different connotations. Bird watching is more of the passive aspect of watching birds. It's the hobby. It's watching birds that come to your feeders or watching the birds that happen to cross your path while you're on a general nature hike. Whereas bird birding <clears throat> has more of an active connotation. It's the sport aspect of watching birds. It's actively going out in the environment and looking for birds. And <clears throat> it really can be a, a competition, a competition with yourself for birds this year than you did last year. There's always a friendly competition going on uh, among birders to see who's seen the most birds and who's got the best birds on their list. And, and there are even uh, professional competitions. <clears throat> yeah, there's every year in May in New Jersey, there's the World Series of Birding, where teams come from around the world to compete to see the greatest number of species in the state of New Jersey in a 24 hour period. And it's not just for the, the glory of the trophy, but it's also to raise money for bird conservation. The teams get sponsors, they get pledges. So the more birds they see, the more money they raise for bird conservation. And this goes on all over the country. There's the Texas Gulf Coast Birding Classic. Even here in Arkansas, Audubon, Arkansas has Bird LR Birdathon, where teams are competing to see birds uh, in central Arkansas. Uh, if you want to learn more about the Bird LR Birdathon, you can find Arkansas's website, ar.audubon.org, and you can see a little bit about the teams that are competing to raise money to support Audubon, Arkansas's bird conservation and education programs. But whether you are enjoying birds as a hobby or a sport, there is no doubt that birding is a really popular pastime. I've heard a number of statistics that birding is the second most popular outdoor hobby in the U.S. next to gardening, that there are more bird watchers than there are hunters and anglers combined, although I know a lot of hunters who tell me they spend a lot of time watching birds when they're sitting in their blinds. And also there are more bird watchers than there are NASCAR fans. So a lot of birders out there and we all add up to a very powerful economic force. Birding has become a multi-billion dollar industry. Uh, if you feed birds, you know you can easily spend a lot of money. Those little buggers can eat you out of house and home if you let them. Uh, so there's money spent on bird feeders, bird seed, uh, field guides, binoculars, and then if you're traveling, you spend money on gas, food, lot, all sorts of things. And a lot of places understand that. There's a lot of communities around the country that are advertising to birders, trying to encourage them to come to their town and spend their avatarism money in their community to see the great birds that they have. But if you want to watch birds, you don't need to spend billions, millions, or even necessarily thousands of dollars, but there are two things you do need to buy. First, 
is your binocular. And there are certain things to consider when choosing binoculars. First is the feel of the binocular. How do they feel in your hands? Different brands are shaped differently. Our hands and faces are shaped differently. Uh, so that makes choosing binoculars in part a personal choice. If you're in a group of birders, it helps to ask people if you can try their binoculars and see how they feel in your hands and against your face. So I can't necessarily tell you, you need to buy brand X. It's something of a personal choice. Then there's the cost. <clears throat> and the general wisdom is that you should buy the most expensive binoculars for because with birding optics, you get what you pay for. And the more expensive birding optics, they are better, better quality, better lenses, better coating on the lenses for a sharper, brighter image. They're waterproof, fogproof, impact resistant. They have better keys and guarantees. So some of the best companies will fix or even replace your worn binoculars, your damaged binoculars for free. Yeah. So also if you get cheaper binoculars, you decide you really love this and you want to upgrade, you end up spending a little bit more money in the long run. So I've got Swarovski's. Swarovski's, the uh, same company that makes those crystal statues, also makes high-end birding optics. I bought my Swarovski ELs about 12 years ago now. Back then they cost me $1,500. I know that's a lot. Nowadays, good Swarovski's are more like $2,000 to $2,500. So they're only going up in price, which also means get them now before they get even more expensive. Uh, but then you can still buy really good optics for cheaper than that, for anywhere from say $500 to $1,000. Just in general, stay away from anything that's under $100 unless you're buying them for a child, because those are not good binoculars at all. And then the other thing is the size of the binoculars. And binoculars are measured with two digits. There's a single digit, an X, and then a double digit. The single digit is the magnification. It's how many times closer the image appears through the binocular versus your naked eye. And birding optics come between seven power or seven X up to 10 power. And it's power is not meant for bird watching. Now, you might think I'm going to get higher power binoculars to see the bird, but there's a trade-off there because, first of all, higher power binoculars not only magnify the image, but also magnify the natural hand tremors that we all have. So higher power binoculars are harder to hold steady. Also, with higher power binoculars, you actually have a smaller field of view. So if you are trying to see ducks on a pond or shorebirds on a mudflat, or if you're just watching your feeder birds, higher power can work. But if you're trying to find a little songbird flitting through the trees, forget it. Trying to find the bird and stay on the bird with 10 power binoculars is a challenge. So magnification, not necessarily better. And then the other digit, the double digit, is the size of the objective lens, the outside lens in millimeters. And birding optics come between 32 millimeters up to 50 millimeters. And again, bigger is good because it lets in more light. So you can have a brighter image under low light conditions. But the trade-off is that you have a bigger lens, which means a bigger barrel, which means bigger binoculars, which means heavier binoculars. So if you're trying to hold them around your neck for a long time or hold them up against your face and look up into the trees for a long time, big binoculars get tiring. Now, then again, these days, newer binoculars are made with better materials that are strong but lightweight. So big binoculars these days are not as heavy as the older binoculars, but still bigger is not necessarily better. And then in general, I recommend for most birding situations, mid-range bins. So some combination of seven or eight power and 35 or 42. So seven by 35s, seven by 42s, eight by 35, eight by 42. My Swarovskis come 
the, my Swarovskis are 8.5 by 42. And not all brands come in that half step magnification, but I thought 8.5 was a good trade off between low and high end. And then the other thing you need is a field guide. And this is one of my two cats, indoor cat only, of course. And she is being her field guide. She is learning which species to expect in the backyard. And uh, a good field guide has three components. First, I, I know you can't read this. This is, you're not supposed to be able to read this slide. This is just meant to illustrate the three components of a field guide. So first, of course, there is the plate of illustrations. These can be artist illustrations, they can be uh, photographs, or in this case, these are digital photos that have been altered to bring out the field marks and change the positions of the birds. And it's good if a field guide shows the natural range of variation for a species, male, female, breeding, non-breeding, adult, juvenile, that kind of thing. Also nice if a field guide has little arrows pointing to the main characteristics that identify that bird, the field marks of that species. And then also it's nice if you have multiple similar looking species on a play for easy comparison. Next component is the text. And that tells you, of course, how to identify the bird, but also depending upon the guide, will describe the song, the range, and the habitat, and maybe something about the bird's conservation. And it's good if that information is on the same page as or the facing page from the illustrations so you can read about the bird and see it. Look at the bird and read about it. Easy comparison. And then lastly, there is the range maps, which of course tell you where the species is found and using color coding tells you what season the bird is found in that area. And in this case, this guide also uses shading to say whether a species is regularly found in that area in that season or not frequently found in that area in that season. And again, it's good if the range maps are together with the text and the illustrations. So the range maps are a good way to quickly cut birds from the decision making. So let's say you are in Arkansas and you see a hummingbird and you think it's one of these four species. Well, that doesn't occur in Arkansas. And uh, the anise, that doesn't occur in Arkansas. That does not occur in Arkansas. Oh, that one occurs in Arkansas. That's probably the hummingbird that I see. Now, birds do get out of range, but by definition, a rare bird, a rare occurrence, and you should first go towards the expected species before you jump to a rare bird, out of range, extra limital species ID. And then people ask me, are, are, when you get your field guide, you should spend time reading and studying it because uh, field guides have introductory text that tells you how to use the guide and it will tell you how to look at birds. Also, it's nice to go through, look at the species and get a feel for what species occur in your area. When you are looking at a bird, don't just take a real brief look and then go to your field guide. You want to spend time watching the bird. Take it all in. Watch the bird until you really see it or until it flies off and then you can't see it anymore. And then you will have more information that you need to go to your field guide and identify it. If you're not sure, if you can't find the bird in the book, it helps to consult more than one guide because different guides have different field marks. The illustrations vary depending upon the quality of the photo, the artist's abilities. And then also, there's going to be variation in the field, and no field guide can adequately express, express all the variation. There's going to be albino birds and dark birds and hybrids and you're going to see, you know, the field guides illustrate the birds in perfect light and perfect position, but in reality they're going to be in bright light and deep shade and with branches covering parts of their body. You're going to see them from just the butt side. So 
you're not necessarily going to see the bird under perfect conditions. There's going to be variations. If you're not on more than one guide, and then when people ask me for recommendations, even though I work for National Audubon, I don't really like the Audubon guide. Now, to be fair, the National Audubon Field Guide is a uh, just a licensed product, and really, National Audubon, we put our effort into our online field guide, where there's a lot more information that goes into that. So if you're trying to learn to identify a bird, you can go to Audubon's online guide to North American birds. But of course, it does help to have a paper field guide. So I do have recommendations there. On the one hand, there is the Peterson guide to birds. And this comes in Eastern and Western editions. Uh, Roger Tory Peterson was a excellent bird watcher and bird artist, and he is the inventor of the modern day field guide. So all field guides today are based on the Peterson system that boils down identification to a few key field marks. Uh, and a lot of expert birders these days started with the Peterson field guide, myself included. There's also the National Geographic Guide to Birds. That one has good illustrations, a nice feature of that one is that it has tabs on the, the side of it to help you find the groups of birds in the book. And then there's the Sibley Guide to Birds. And David Allen Sibley, also an excellent birder, excellent bird artist. And the innovation that he brought to the field guide is that he illustrates every single bird with the wings spread up and the wings spread down. Whereas most field guides illustrate the birds just with the wings closed at the side, but that can conceal important field marks that are on this full spread wing. Also, when it comes to uh, the field guides, Sibley has a birding basics book that I really recommend. It goes over tools and skills like I am doing today. And then he also has the Sibley guide to bird life and behavior, which uh, again talks about watching birds, behavior of birds, and goes through all the major families of birds in North America and tells you more about them. Great guys. But like so many things there th these days, there's an app for that. And for every paper field guide, there is an app version and then some. And the apps are wonderful because the apps contain all the information in the field guide and more. And what's great is the apps also have the sounds of the bird. So you can hear a bird in the field and play the bird in the app and compare the two right there in real time. And there's also another app, a free app from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology that I highly recommend called Merlin. Like the wizard, but really named for the falcon, Merlin in any case is a wizard at bird ID. So if you see a bird you don't know, you answer a series of questions about the size, the color, that kind of thing. And then Merlin will give you a short list of species that it may be. Now, keep in mind that Merlin's answer will depend upon the information you put in. So don't necessarily take the first choice as the correct choice. You want to investigate each species and see if it matches what you're seeing in the field, including playing the sound. And then another cool feature of Merlin is that it has photo recognition abilities. It uses facial recognition software to identify a bird from a photo that you upload. If you can take a, a photo of a bird in the field, upload one of your photos from a camera into your phone, Merlin can identify it for you. And it does a really good job at that. Free app, really recommend it. All right. So, in the field, you've got your binocular, you've got your field guide, you see a bird, now what? Now, what do you do? What things should you note to help you identify the bird? Well, there are a number of things, and I'll go through each one of these in turn. First, and of course, most obvious with the birds is the color. Birds are colorful. Birds use their color to identify themselves as members of a particular species, and we can cue in on those color patterns to identify the birds. 
But it is important to recognize that color can vary within a species, as I kind of alluded to earlier. Of course, most obvious is the sex of the bird. And in most cases, males tend to be more brightly colored than the females. Good example, indigo buntings, where males are that deep indigo blue color, whereas females are mostly brown with hints of blue on their wings and tail. Bird can also change color depending on their age. Good example is the bald eagle. Adult bald eagles have that characteristic white head, white tail, brown body, but immature bald eagles have a brown head, brown tail, and then various amount of white modeling in the body and the wings. And the extent of the white can help you age an eagle. And an eagle takes about four years to mature. And uh, a reason why immature birds sometimes look like a different color than the adults is to signal to the adults that they are not competition for mates. They can't mate yet. Don't beat them up. Don't chase them away. Leave them alone. And then even within an age and a sex, birds can vary by season. And birds are more brightly colored in the breeding season than the non-breeding season. Good example is the American goldfinch. In the breeding season, the adult males, bright lemon yellow, black uh, head, black wings, black tail, white wing bars. That's a wing bar there, that white slash in the wing. After the breeding season, the males molt, and the next set of feathers that come in are largely brown, with hints of yellow. Although they still have the black wings, black tail, white wing bars. And then also, birds can vary by feather wear. Feathers all wear out over time, which is why birds molt to have fresh feathers. And a European starling changes its plumage pattern in part through wear. So when the fall comes and the winter is coming, starlings molt and their fresh molt looks like the bird on the left. It has black feathers and every black feather has a white tip on it. And then over the course of the winter, those white tips wear off through flight, through abrasion, because white pigment is structurally weaker than the black pigment. And by the time the breeding season comes on, the bird is glossy black. And most of the white tips have worn away, revealing all that glossy black plumage. So that's just wear and not molt. Although also look at the difference in the beak color between breeding and non-breeding, and that is a matter of pigment change. So <clears throat> while you are looking at the feathers of the bird, also be noting the hard parts, the beak, the feet. And while this may not tell you what species you have, it can tell you what type of bird that you have. Maybe a raptorial bird, like a sharp gin hawk, with that sharply hooked bill and sharply hooked talons for grabbing prey and tearing into it or a wading bird that has a long bill for dabbing into the water and catching fish and frogs with long legs and skinny toes for wading in the water and the mud, or a woodpecker that has that short, short chisel-shaped bill and feet with two toes forward, two toes backwards to help them hold on to trees. There's also a, there's a warbler bill, there's a vireo bill, there's a thrush bill, there's a blackbird bill. Knowing bill types can help you identify types of birds. Also compare the size of the bird. Now a field guide was gonna tell you that one bird is five inches and another bird is 5.25 inches. Now let me tell you, you are not gonna be able to distinguish that size difference in the field. But if you are looking at an unknown bird, it can help to try to compare it to a size standard a bird you really know well that you can imagine and compare to the unknown bird. So for example, you might say that a cedar waxwing is bigger than a house sparrow, but smaller than a robin. Whereas a blue jay is bigger than a robin, but smaller than a crow. That being said, I do urge you to take your estimates of bird size with a grain of salt, because the apparent size of a bird can vary depending upon many things, such as distance, viewing angle, lighting, 
background, the bird's posture, whether it's uh, sleeked down or puffed up, uh, as well as your own experience with estimating a bird's size. Uh, uh, plenty of times a, bird, a, a person has told me, I saw the biggest woodpecker. It must have been two feet tall. Well, no woodpecker is two feet tall, but I'm sure it was a very big woodpecker, probably a pileated woodpecker if it was that big. Behavior can also be a good key to an ID. Is the bird climbing down a tree head first like a nuthatch? Is it constantly pumping its tail like an Eastern Phoebe? Is it bobbing its head like a pigeon? Is it always in a flock like a goose? Habitat, another very important way to distinguish birds. Now, some species are habitat generalists and found in a wide variety of habitats, and some are habitat specialists and found in only one or a narrow range of habitats. So habitat can be a clue to identifying birds. I'll give an example here. Here we have two species of longspurs, kind of like sparrows with a different family. Both of these long spurs occur in eastern Arkansas, the delta, the flatlands of eastern Arkansas, in the winter time. Both of these birds occur at Stuttgart Airport. Stuttgart Airport is a great birding place, one of my favorite places to bird, in part because it has remnants of prairie habitat. Uh, but at Stuttgart Airport, at Stuttgart Airport, if you see a long spur, you can distinguish them by habitat. Because these two birds look a lot alike, they sound a lot alike, but the lap and long spurs are found only in bare agricultural fields. Think of a big field of mud and um, spilled grain and scattered clumps of vegetation, and that kind of thing. That's what lap and long spurs like to be in. And you find some of that at the airport. Smith's long spurs, however, are an extreme habitat specialist they like the short species of grass in the genus Aristida called three-on grass. And three-on grass grows in poor soils, which you often find along airport runways. And Stuttgart Airport is the only place that lets birders go birding along the runways. And because Smith's longspurs occur in only a small, they winter in only a small portion of the South Central United States, Birders come from all over the country to see Swiss long spurs at Stuttgart Airport. Anyway, I digress. If you're at Stuttgart Airport and birding, and you flush a long spur from the agricultural fields, it's a Lapland. If it pops out of the three on, it's a Smith long spur. And then range. Range and season. Is the bird found in your area to begin with? Is it found only in the summertime, only in the winter, only during migration, or year round? This is a great way to, uh, as a first cut, when you're trying to decide if you're seeing a certain type of bird or not. And this goes back to the range maps in the field guide. And then last but not least, there are the steps that the birds make. And in general, birds make songs and calls. And not all birds sing. And the, distinct, this, the distinction between songs and calls is a little bit arbitrary. But in general, songs are long, complex sounds. They are used to defend a territory and attract a, a mate. And songs are learned. A baby bird has to hear its species song in order to properly sing it. Whereas calls are shorter, simpler sounds. They are innate. A bird is born knowing all its calls. And birds have a variety of call types used for all sorts of things. Uh, used, there, there are you know, begging calls when a baby bird is hungry. There are, uh, there are contact calls for pairs. I mean, you, you know, when you hear Canada geese in a flock, they're always so noisy. <laughs> That's a flock cohesion call to keep them together. There are alarm calls when predators are around, all sorts of calls, all sorts of functions. 
And it is really important to learn the songs and calls of birds because so often you will hear a bird before you see it, or you will hear a bird and you won't see it. Even, even in my yard, when I'm watching my backyard birds every day, I can hear that mockingbird singing off in the distance and hear the Carolina wren and hear the cowbird calling from somewhere up in the trees. Even though I don't see them, I can still count them on my daily list. Now, it's a challenge to learn bird songs because their language is so different from ours. So the trick then is to try to put their, their words into our words. And we do that by using mnemonics, uh, by trying to come up with a way to better remember the bird sounds. And there are some mnemonics that seem to be universal. Everyone knows them and uses them. And sometimes you just have to create your own mnemonics. And I'll just give a few examples of some that I like. So, for example, the Northern Bob White conveniently says its name, er, Bob White. <whistles> the Kildeer also says its name, Kildeer, Kildeer, Kildeer. The American Robin has a, a caroling song, short phrases that are caroling, cheerily, cheerio, cheerio, cheerily, cheerio. Maybe it should be called the British Robin or the European Robin, but the European Robin name was already taken. Can you hear that? Cheerio, cheerio, cheerily. The barred owl says, who cooks for you? Who cooks for you all? Or here in the South, they say, who cooks for you? Who cooks for y'all? <coughs> also Chuck Wills' widow in the background, also says his name. more than who cooks for you. Oh, man, I, I love it when barn owls get riled up. They sound like monkeys in the trees. It's really cool. And then the warbling vireo says, if I see you, then I'll seize you and I'll squeeze you till you squirt. Now, it, it doesn't actually sound like it's saying these words, but this helps you remember the rhythm of the song. It's a rolling song with an accent at the end. If I see you, then I'll seize you, and I'll squeeze you to your squirt. works, right? So <clears throat> there are apps out there that can help you identify a song. If you hear a bird singing and you hold your phone up towards the song, get a recording, it will give you some idea of what species is singing. I haven't personally played with these apps. There's one called BirdNet by Cornell Lab of Ornithology that's constantly expanding its repertoire. Uh, Bird, BirdNet is only for Android right now. There isn't an iPhone version, but you can go to BirdNet online and upload a recording and it will identify it for you. And not only that, if there are multiple species singing that recording, it will pick out all the birds that are singing. Technology is amazing. Okay, so there are some skills you need to get better identifying birds. Remember, you need to learn to see the details, the details of the plumage, the pattern, the voice. Remember to consider the context. Where are you? What time of year is it? 
What habitat are you in? And then look for patterns. Uh, when you see this bird, do you see it nine times out of 10, one time out of 20? Is it, is it only found in urban areas? Is it only found in the park? When you do this, you start to build your expectations so that even before you go out bird watching, you know what species to expect. So it's early spring, I'm in central Arkansas, I'm gonna go in the woods, and at this time of year, I expect that the first black and white warblers and yellow-throated warblers are gonna be showing up. Remember, anything worth doing takes practice, spend time studying your field guides, learning what species to expect, go out and, and join experts in the field. It really helps to speed up your learning. You can be with other birders who know what they're looking at and they can point out that species and say, that is that bird and here's why. Then you also need to try it on your own. I recommend starting local, start in your backyard with the common feeder birds, the birds that you can see up close day in and day out, get good with those and then expand your radius around your neighborhood, your nearby park, your nearby national wildlife refuge. And over time, you'll expand the number of birds that you can identify. Be patient with yourself. Any good skill, any good pastime takes time to develop. You're gonna make mistakes. You're gonna, uh, you're gonna take a photo, identify it, share with people, and they're gonna tell you, oh, you made a mistake. That's not this bird, it's this bird. Learn from it, it's okay. We're all here to help each other. Birders are a welcoming bunch. And then above all else, be sure to have fun. Because if you're not having fun, it's not worth doing it, right? So I really appreciate uh, your time and attention. You're joining me today. I hope you are excited about looking at birds and going out and getting your binocular and your field guide. And I will start answering some questions now. I'm going to look at the chat. Uh, so someone asks, how best to record the bird sound? Well, if it's close enough, you can just use the microphone in your phone, either a microphone app or the bird sound ID app. When you start running that, it will start using your phone's microphone to record the sound and then identify it. Yeah, so someone else said the voice memo app would do that. Again, if you have questions, you can type them into the chat box or you can type them into the comments box in the Facebook page. I should also mention that uh, National Geographic has a birding essentials book, which again covers the tools, techniques, and tips needed to become a better birder. Should you physically buy a pair of binoculars in person? Yes, that is helpful. If you can uh, go to the store and they'll let you try them out, good. If you are with a group of birders, I recommend trying other birders' binoculars to see which one works for you. But also good binocular companies, if you buy binoculars, you don't like them, they'll let you return them at a certain time frame. And a good place to look for binoculars. Uh, if you have a wild bird store near you, that's good. Sporting good stores can have binoculars. Uh, we find them online too. The range of the green jay, the furthest the green jay goes. Oh, green jays, beautiful birds, real common in the tropics south of our border. And they do get up into Texas. That's a, 
uh, southern Texas and even up into central Texas is the further, furthest north that green jays get. I would highly recommend going birding in southern Texas to see green jays and brown jays and a whole bunch of species that are characteristic of Mexico that you can't see anywhere else but in southern Texas, like chachalacas and other cool birds. Southeast Arizona is also an amazing place to see Mexican species that just occur in that area in the U.S., like elegant trogans. You need permission to go bird watching at Stuttgart Airport. So there is an office there, and it is good to go to the office and check in with them so they know you're there. There is also a birder's register that I put at Stuttgart Airport's office where I would ask that you check in, you write down who you are, where you're from, and when you're done birding, you can go back there and write in the species that you've seen to share that with other birders. There's also a map to where to find the different species, and um, there's a photocopy of the page that shows you the Smith's long spurs there. How, let's see, uh, how do you encourage diversity in your yard? So um, a variety of food helps diversity, seed, sugar water, fruit, that kind of thing. So different feeders, different types of food, oranges for Orioles, grape jelly for Orioles, uh, also native plants. Native plants are really good bird food. Native plants provide habitat for birds. Native plants attract a number of species that are looking for weed seeds, not weed seed, but looking for native plant seeds and insects that are harbored in native plants. So like I've seen common yellow throats hopping around in my yard during migration, indigo buntings in my yard that are not going for the seed in the feeder, but they're picking off the seed and the insects that are in my native plant yard. And I've gotten all Arkansas native plant yard. So habitat diversity encourages bird diversity. Oh, uh, I was reminded to talk about the, uh, the Arkansas Audubon Society field list. So if you're in Arkansas, the Arkansas Audubon Society, a sister organization to Audubon Arkansas, who I work for, they maintain the official state checklist of birds. And that list not only the species that have been found in Arkansas, but in the compact format tell you how often the species are found in the state, and for migratory birds, tell you the week within month to expect the species to arrive and to depart. So that is a fantastic resource. Any bird watcher in Arkansas needs to have a copy of that. And you can find that at the website arbirds.org and look for the field list. Do hawks and falcons eat other birds? They sure do. That is what they do. Uh, hawks and falcons are native predators. They're a natural part of the environment. Uh, and birds are used to having hawks and falcons around. For the most part, nine times out of 10, these birds are not successful going after birds. They're so I say enjoy it. It's part of nature. It's exciting. At least I think it's exciting to see a Cooper's hawk come around in my yard. Cooper's hawks being bird specialists, in, at least in um, much of North America, Cooper's hawks are the main one that's chasing your birds, especially morning doves. But if you are, if you don't like the fact that a hawk's coming around to get your feeder birds, then stop feeding the birds for a couple of weeks because the, the songbirds are coming for the seed and the hawks are coming for the songbirds. So if the songbirds disperse, the hawk will go elsewhere. Do you need to get a new field guide if yours was published in the 90s because the range changed? Yes, absolutely. Ranges change, birds are expanding their ranges, birds are contracting ranges, uh, and names are changing, taxonomy is changing, species are being split, species are being lumped. So a good a new field guide, especially in the last decade, will have the latest range maps and that kind of thing. Uh, also, 
eBird is another great resource. eBird.org has in a species explorer where you can see a real time current range map of where species are being seen. And that includes even all of the extra liminal sightings that the field guide range maps just can't cover. Sure, yeah, we can I'll make a note to add links about the apps and the books that I talked about. So I'm writing that down. Okay. Um, aren't southern birds coming further north as temperatures rise? Yes, that is happening. Uh, National Audubon has released uh, a couple of studies, one several years ago and one just last year, showing that bird ranges are expanding northwards with warming winter temperatures and bird ranges are expected to expand and also, unfortunately for many birds, contract as temperature changes. And we're already seeing this. Uh, in Arkansas, we're seeing greater roadrunners and scissor tail flycatchers and Mississippi kites and black bellied whistling ducks have all expanded their ranges northeastwards over the last decade or so. I've even seen it in my 15 years in Arkansas. <clears throat> when do the Orioles arrive or have they migrated through the area? Well, uh, if you're in Arkansas, the Orioles have already just started to arrive. There was a, a photo posted to Facebook to the Arkansas Birders Group just the other day of an immature male Baltimore Oriole. But if you have your Arkansas Audubon Society field list handy, you'll open it up, you'll go to Baltimore Oriole, and you'll see 4A to 9D. 4A meaning the first week of April is when Baltimore Orioles are expected to show up. And then Orchard Orioles too, also 4A, first week of April. So it's almost time to get your Oriole feeders up. Oh, and ruby throated hummingbirds have arrived in Arkansas. Get your feeders out and purple martins are here. Get your birdhouses up. In fact, I saw purple martins today at a birdhouse. How can you prevent hawks and falcons from scaring away songbirds? So uh, for one thing, provide cover for the birds. Shrubs, trees, Brush piles provide cover for birds so they have a place to go to if a hawk is coming around. If the hawk is constantly around, take your feeders down so the birds go somewhere else. Uh, but I, again, I would say enjoy those birds. They're natural native predators. Our songbirds are used to it. Cats are really the problem for birds. Cats are not native predators. Cats are efficient hunters. Even when they're not hungry, they kill birds. Cats are the number one predator to birds worldwide, and they're much more of a concern than the hawks. Ah, sugar water ratio. So the sugar water ratio for your hummingbirds is four to one. Four to one, four parts water, one part sugar. So picture your hand. Your thumb is the sugar and the rest of your fingers are the water. Four parts water, one part sugar. Just maintain that ratio year round. That ratio mimics the ratio of sugar to water in plant nectar that the hummingbirds are getting. And also when it comes to feeding hummingbirds, uh, just white table sugar and tap water. No brown sugar, no other sugar substitutes, and no red food coloring, no artificial red dyes. Please don't buy any of that stuff. It's not good for the hummingbirds. Sugar and water is all you need. Uh, a natural way to keep cats out of the yard without hurting the cats. Well, there are um, bibs and scrunchies and things you can put around a cat to help prevent them from 
getting to the birds in the first place, trying to keep cats out of the yard could be very challenging. Uh, one thing to do though, is you wanna provide cover for the birds to go into, but you don't wanna have a shrub right next to your feeder. You don't wanna give a place for a cat to hide so it can jump right out at the bird and get it at the feeder. Restrictions on grape jelly. So um, I, I would say probably all natural organic grape jelly, since it's the healthiest thing for us, would be the healthiest thing for birds. Again, no artificial dyes and that kind of stuff uh, would be the best thing, healthiest thing for birds. So if you want to get grape jelly, try to get the natural stuff if you're going to feed it to your Orioles. And oranges too are good for Orioles. And also when it comes to Orioles, since they like nectar, you can buy feeders that are bigger and have bigger perches, bigger openings that are meant for an Oriole to perch on and drink from. How to keep ants out of a hummingbird feeder. You do that with an ant moat. So just a cup. You can buy one, you can make one, but some kind of cup of water that hangs between the hook and the hummingbird feeder will keep the ants out. And be sure to keep that ant moat filled with water at all times. Oh, and by the way, the slide I'm showing you now, those binoculars are too big. Don't buy those binoculars. <laughs> Oh, someone asked, what's my favorite bird? The cedar waxwing is my favorite bird. Uh, I just think they're so subtly beautiful. Uh, they just seem so happy, such a happy sound. See, see, they're social. And if they eat fermented berries, they get tipsy. So they're a lot of fun at parties too, I bet. Love cedar waxwings. I even named my first cat cedar after the cedar waxwing. Someone asked about butterfly feeders. Uh, so for butterflies, again, native plants would be the best thing for butterflies. Uh, if you wanna feed butterflies, you gotta have the, the flowering plants that provide nectar and have a, have a variety of species of plants that bloom at different times of year from early spring to late fall to provide a food source all across the, the season for the butterflies. And even more important than the nectar are the host plants for the larvae because most butterflies are, are specialists where their caterpillar can eat only one species or a narrow range of species. So for example, the monarch is a great example. Monarch caterpillars can eat only milkweed and Adult monarchs will feed on non-native plants like butterfly bush and lantana and zinnias. And if you want to make more monarchs, you've got to have milkweeds and you've got to have the native milkweeds. Also, one thing for butterflies about feeding is that they like minerals and, and uh, salts and that kind of thing. Uh, so you can, you'll see in the field where you'll see butterflies puddling, they'll go to mud, They'll go to wet sand, they'll go to uh, animal feces even. Uh, so you can attract butterflies by having some mud, by having uh, spilling some beer into some sand and that kind of thing to make some wet areas and nutrients for them. Any other questions?
Um, thank you, everybody. I, I've got, uh, I'll make an announcement when this one is posted, when, when the recording is posted, and I've got two more webinars coming up. One tomorrow at 7 p.m. Central Time, creating a bird-friendly yard, and then one on Thursday at 12 o'clock Central Time, ornithology through philately. I'm also a bird stamp collector. You can learn a lot about birds through stamps. Oh, one more question's come in. Uh, do cardinals or blue jays ever fly or live in groups or are they solitary? Blue jays, definitely social creatures, especially in migration and in the wintertime. Cardinals, uh, they're a little more territorial throughout the year, but you can see them in small groups for sure. And then cardinals, they're, the mated pairs hang out all year round as well. Oh, and someone wanted to remind me about the turkey and quail stamp program. Oh, yes. Uh, uh, just like there's the federal duck stamp program that raises money for wetland habitat conservation, Arkansas has a quail stamp and a turkey stamp that raises money for habitat conservation here in Arkansas. Yes. Yes, Tali, I will remember to mention that on my webinar. Thank you, I will write that down. Okay, well, thank you everybody. Have a great day and be good and good birding to you.